I'm taking the fish oils and uh, and then it sort of went into the discussions on, on, on the food chain and if this was good for your heart. It really sounded like it was a miracle medicine. So then I started to think about it, if it really could be that good that media wants it to look like. The society doesn't accept high risks when it comes to food. Sweden, a small idyllic suburb not far from Stockholm. Here began a scientific adventure for Michaela, an adventure whose impact and importance she could not have foreseen at the time. Every morning, before going off to school, Michaela has breakfast together with her father. Both attach great importance to a healthy diet. Michaela starts her day with a glass of milk. Her father, however, has a different habit. And it was this habit that became the subject of a scientific school project. Michaela discovered high quantities of contaminants in a supposedly health-enhancing food supplement. Every morning, Michaela's father takes omega-3 capsules. Omega-3 fatty acids are found naturally in some of our foods. They can also be specially prepared as food supplements. And it was these supplements that Michaela decided to investigate. I guess I'm a quite curious person, so I always ask the questions why and how does it come and further questions. Michaela's research confirmed the capsule's good reputation. Omega-3 fatty acids can have a positive impact on blood circulation, lowering blood fats and improving the body's immune response. But Michaela wanted to find an answer to a different question. Omega-3 products are made from plant, fish or seal oil. Is it possible that the products have different levels of chemical contamination? Might they contain dioxins? The food chain. Here, every organism serves as food for an organism located higher in the food chain. Thus, fish may eat plankton containing contaminants such as dioxins. The higher an organism is located in the food chain, the higher the concentration of these contaminants will be. Seals, for instance, may have high concentrations of contaminants because their diet consists of large quantities of fish. Therefore, omega-3 products made from seal oil could possibly represent a higher risk for humans than those prepared from fish oil. My father was taking these pills and at the moment we decided that we should make this project. There was a documentary on the TV about omega-3 and all the good effects. So that made it even more interesting to look a bit closer at it. The key question for Michaela was, do omega-3 capsules made from seal oil have higher levels of chemical contaminants with known adverse health effects than omega-3 capsules made from fish or plants? She went to find out. Michaela obtained permission to join scientists at well-known research institutes in Sweden and Germany to examine the omega-3 products in particular to see what chemical contaminants were present inside the oils. The analyzing process was very complicated. It took uh, about two days or something. And uh, we did it uh, uh, by using a GCMS. So we first extracted the oils and then we looked at the levels of PCBs and dioxins. PCBs and dioxins are industrially produced contaminants. They are present in the air, water or soil. Ultimately, they find their way into living organisms, including humans. More than 90% of these chemical poisons known to cause cancer are taken up by humans through food. Michaela investigated the concentration of these contaminants in various omega-3 products. The results came by email, and uh, 
we sat down together and looked at the, the data and we saw this went through the fish oils and the vegetables. There was not much to find there, but coming to the seal oil, it was huge, you know, and we said, wow, this is amazing. I mean, how much can they actually sell these products in the health store? Michaela's studies showed that omega-3 capsules made from seal oil carry a higher health risk than products made from plant or fish oil. This small school project with my daughter uh, actually being of interest to the general public in a sense because the, the, the data and the results was, was really exciting. Now. So this small school research project not only produced important scientific results, but also raised questions about society as a whole. When do we speak of a food safety risk? Who decides whether the environmental impact and health risks are so serious that immediate action has to be taken? How does such a decision-making process take place? Are scientists and decision-makers the only ones responsible for dealing with societal risks? Michaela took the initiative herself, deciding to present, together with her father, the results of her study to the food agency in Uppsala. I think I have the right to go to the food agency because I think everybody sh should have the same uh, rights. And even though I'm just a young student, I think it should be taken seriously. At this meeting, the implication of her findings will not be the only topic of discussion. Michaela will want to know how the risks associated with her findings are assessed and managed. Will the agency intervene? And if so, what actions will be taken? At the food agency in Uppsala, the toxicologist Anders Glynn awaits Michaela and her father. However, he himself does not decide whether omega-3 products made from seal oil will continue to be sold in the stores. He will mainly assess Michaela's results according to predefined evaluation standards. The concentrations of dioxins and dioxin-like PCBs were high in this seal oil compared to the fish oils. Uh, it was, the, although not high enough to be above the maximum limit of, of PCBs and dioxins in fish oil, because that's 10, and this, this concentration was 7, I guess. Uh, but it is above the action limit, which is a lower limit where if we find this in our control, we are obliged to go back to the company and tell them that you have levels above the action limit. You can continue to sell this product, but when we come back within a year and analyze it again, it has to be below the action limit. Thus, in risk governance, in the way decision makers deal with risks, value limits play a crucial role. They can be seen as alarm triggers. In the second part of the 19th century, they were introduced for industrial safety. These value limits set the stage for risk discussions. Against the backdrop of acceptable risk limits, it becomes possible to assess existing risks and, ultimately, to take appropriate decisions. I will show the results to our control department, who, who does the food control, and um, they will decide then if they're going to include maybe the seal oil in the control program. But the budget for the control is really tight, so and, and also the commission sets the number of samples you should take, the EU commission, how, how many samples you should take. And usually they also say this year you're going to concentrate on milk or fish or things like that. So we don't know if it's possible to bring in this, this uh, fish oils again into the control next year. Despite the uncertainties, Michaela remains optimistic. I think they're going to retest the results and then I don't know what they will do next but um, well that depends on the results. I will contact them again 
in about a month or something and see what they have made. An exceptional young student has called attention to a risk affecting many health conscious people. A risk that should have been investigated by experts long ago. It remains uncertain if and when the Swedish food authorities will pursue Michaela's research work further. But one can do more than just wait and see. With my knowledge now, I wouldn't eat the seal oil because I think um, the risks with it is too high and I think the benefits, it's not compared to it, so I wouldn't take the risk. On the basis of her own risk analysis, Michaela, as a consumer, was able to make her own decision. Consuming the omega-3 seal oil products is a risk she is not willing to take.